Luke chapter 8. I'm going to read a, a few verses, although we're only going to concentrate really on, on one. I'll read uh, these few verses, mainly to put it into some context. Uh, hopefully it will make a little more sense that way. Uh, starting with verse number 22, this is Luke chapter 8, New International Version of the Bible, where we see this. One day, Jesus said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into the boat and set out. As they sailed, he fell asleep. A squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped, and they were in great danger. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are going to drown. He got up, and he rebuked the wind and the raging waters, and the storm subsided, and all was calm. Where is your faith? he asked his disciples. In fear and amazement, they asked one another, Who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. Now, I said that I was going to read you a few verses, but we were really only going to concentrate on one verse. It's really that very last one in the reading. In that particular verse, there are two questions, and they become our focus this morning. Uh, the first uh, uh, question Jesus, uh, 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 Jesus asked of his disciples, uh, and the second question the disciples basically asked each other. Um, nonetheless, though, one was asked to Jesus and the other were at, was asked amongst the disciples. Uh, both are incredibly important, as we shall see. Now, we're going to start our discussion on all of this with the second question first. This is the one that the disciples uh, were asking uh, one another. Uh, the question that the disciples ask each other basically comes down to this, is, who is this? Uh, as you can well imagine, that was probably uh, a, a, fairly, uh, a fairly important question at, at that moment, but really, more than anything else, I think that it discloses, that it reveals um, the, 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 a certain lack in their understanding at that point in time. Now, I think that all of them at this point in time have been following Jesus because they believed him to be the Messiah. They believed that he was that promised one from the Old Testament, that one who would come to Israel and, uh, and save uh, Israel. So they all had you know, a very clear notion, it seems to me, that, that Jesus was sent by God, that Jesus was anointed by God, uh, that Jesus was promised by God, and therefore uh, there could not be anyone more important than the one who was in the boat with them. Uh, not on the, the entire face of the, the globe. I, I think they understood that. But I don't think that in understanding all of that, that they actually ever really plumbed to the depth of who Jesus was. I, I really don't think their eyes were clearly open to this uh, until that first Resurrection Sunday when he popped amongst them into the room where they were at and suddenly he who was dead was dead no longer. Then things started dawning on them. But at this point in time, just this question, um, it, um, it, it clearly, I think, uh, it, it clearly shows and demonstrates that they weren't quite arrived, uh, not at this point in time. Now, as far as the question itself, who is this? Um, in the original language, it was, uh, it was uh, in the indefinite in interrogative uh, pronoun, or used as the indefinite interrogative pronoun, uh, tis. <coughs> Um, what an interesting word. I mean, sometimes when you run into to words in the original language in the Bible, uh, they have such weird connections to words that we are familiar with. Uh, tis is one such case. It doesn't mean anything like uh, it, it, it does in Greek as it does in English. Um, so let's talk about this for a little bit. When I say it's an indefinite, or uh, it, um, it is an indefinite in interrogative pronoun, what I mean is that it can mean any of a number of things. So for instance, this word is used for who, or what, or where, or when. So if you, if you are asking a question, any of those particular kinds of questions could be led by this particular word. It's, it's, it's an indefinite, uh, indefinite interrogative. 
uh, I would think that uh, just from some of the things that I like to do, that it would make a, a very good word for Jeopardy. If you ever watch Jeopardy, it's a game show, of course, but it is a trivia-based show. Its, it's twist is that all of your answers have to be in the form of a question. And so when you're often watching Jeopardy, you'll hear contestants, just because that formality is necessary, they'll, they'll use some inter uh, interrogative uh, pronoun to lead their questions, but sometimes they don't match. I mean, I've heard contestants say things like, what are the Beatles? Oh, in talking about the music group. Or they'll say, uh, what was Joe DiMaggio? Well, we all know that what was not the, is not the interrogative that should be used there. It should be who. But, you know, in Jeopardy, it doesn't matter. You can, you know, as long as it's a question, it doesn't matter if you have it formed properly grammatically or not. What, what Jeopardy contestants need is a word like tis. I think it just say tis, then, you know, the rest of their answer, and it would work no matter what it was, and it would be proper grammatically. Uh, that's the nature of this indefinite interrogative. Uh, so this is how they, they um, uh, you know, they uh, form this particular question. And I like that because um, we see it most often translated as, who is this? And that really, I don't think, captures maybe quite the gist of what they were actually asking one another. I think they were saying something a little bit more like, what is this? Because they're looking at a guy who looks just like them. If anything, he's probably less handsome. I mean, that's, that's a weird thing to say about the Lord Jesus, but at the same point in time, you know, the Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah, as Isaiah was prophesying about this coming one, he said there was nothing comely in him. There was nothing that was appealing about his appearance. I mean, he, he probably looked as much like, a, like your average everyday slob as, as anybody around at that particular time. So, you know, all of these wonderful pictures and paintings we see of Jesus, and he has this beautifully long, combed out, shining, sheen, sheening hair, and, and he, he, you know, oftentimes he has blue eyes, and I think mm -hmm. Jesus the Jew with blue eyes. Oh, okay, all right, that makes sense. Um, and, you know, and, and he, has, he has a face, and it looks like maybe we could say uh, the, the, the picture of, of Nordic idealism as far as what a man should look like, and I think, you know, that does not match at all the description that we have prophetically from Isaiah. Um, Probably we should have, you know, a, a, a whole different kind of a, 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 a vision in, in mind there. Uh, someone who was, you know, nothing particularly special in his appearance. And if anything, maybe something a little bit like, oh, that guy's a little weird looking. So, uh, when they were looking at Jesus, what did they think about? Well, I think they thought of him mostly as just another dude. He was just another dude, and he just happened to be on the boat with them, going through this same ordeal with them. They, they, they weren't thinking that this is God in the flesh. This, this had not dawned on them yet. They weren't thinking. This is somebody who spoke the worlds into being. They weren't thinking on those terms yet. They weren't thinking in terms of this guy has the power of life and death. This guy has everything within his control, within his power. This guy is the peak of all authority. They weren't thinking in those kinds of terms. They were just looking at a guy who looked pretty regular, who was just one of them. And uh, he was special, but you know that was the kind of thought that they had. Now suddenly, he wakes up from a slumber without missing a beat, Without any hesitation, he stands up, rebukes the wind, rebukes the waves, and they listen to him. And their jaws are dropping. You know, put yourself in, in their place, their jaws are dropping. And suddenly, right, it's starting to dawn on them. This guy is more than meets the eye. This guy is a whole lot more than I ever thought that he was. What exactly is this guy? You know, it began to dawn on, on him. And uh, I like the way that this, now this story is in, in all the Synoptic Gospels, and I like the way that it's uh, framed in the, in the Gospel of Mark, where it talks about their reaction to this feat that, that Jesus had just done. It says that they feared with great fear. 
That's what it says literally in, in Mark chapter 4, verse number 41. So, I mean, it's like they were, I don't want to say terrified, but that actually might not be a bad description of what they were feeling. It, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's like when God gets really, really close, when there's a sense of God's presence, what do you feel like? Now, having been in that experience many times in my life, uh, and sometimes very intensely, I gotta tell you that uh, the first time in particular that I ever had a really clear uh, experience of the presence of God right there with me, it scared the bejeebers out of me. I mean, it shook me up. It, it's frightening to be in the presence of the Lord where God is really revealing something of his glory to, to a mere mortal. It's shocking. And I, I can just imagine that they did fear with great fear uh, at this particular moment. And, you know, they're, they're asking each other, who, what is this? And I, I don't know that they had an answer. At least they didn't at that moment. But they certainly did have a worthy question. Now, that brings us to the, the, uh, the first thing that I want to establish about, about this. Now, um, the titles of, of today's message is, Where is Your Faith? And so this uh, message is a message about faith. And so having said all this, and as far as just uh, getting the, a picture of the disciples' reaction, it brings us to the very first thing that I think that we can apply and establish today about faith. And that is just this. Faith has got to be astonished at Jesus. If your faith concerning Jesus Christ doesn't bring you into a sense of wonder over who he is, something needs to grow. If, if when you are clearly, most openly thinking about Jesus, perceiving Jesus in your heart and mind, if you're not absolutely overwhelmed by the very thought of him, if you're not overwhelmed by the very realization of who he is, and what it means uh, that he is who he is. If, if there's not a sense of like, oh my goodness, you're just quite, you know, not quite there. And there's something that you need yet to capture in your heart and your mind concerning Christ. You're, you're not really, I, I think, totally bought into the reality of who he is, who he is and what he is. Our faith in Christ should be something that, that brings us to a place where, where we absolutely see him beyond a shadow of a doubt as big enough. I think for a lot of people, the, the, the personal accessibility of Jesus is something that overwhelms other considerations. And I'm really grateful that Jesus came in the way that he did, in that humble way that he did in that normal kind of human way that he did. I said he was just another dude to those guys. I'm so grateful that Jesus came in that way because if he came in his full glory, who would have ever had the guts to stand in his presence? Everyone would have just fled for the hills. They would have run for their lives. It's like the, the Israelites when, Je uh, when uh, God showed up as Moses and the Israelites were at Sinai. And all God did was thunder a little bit and speak. I mean, he didn't even necessarily show the fullness of his glory. He just kind of gave them a little glimpse, if you will. And it was enough to scare the life out of them. They said, we don't want to see this anymore. You go up. <laughs> you talk to this guy. You deal with him. He's too much for us. Right? I think that our faith has got to perceive the bigness of Christ. We have to see him in terms that make sense for who he is and what he is. And if we're not seeing him in that kind of a way, there's no way in the world we're going to ever believe in his promises in the way that we need to. There's no way we're ever going to believe in his ability to respond to our cries and to our prayers the way that he's promised. There's just no way in the world we're ever going to really truly believe that he has the power to change our lives along the lines that he's promised. You've got to see Jesus as big enough. You've got to see Jesus in a way that's magnanimous. You've got to see Jesus in a way that's just absolutely stupendous. You've got to see Jesus in his glory. 
Uh, faith has got to embrace this. If our faith does not embrace this to the degree that it does not embrace this, embrace this we will have a diminishing response, a diminishing relationship, a diminishing ability to walk in trust with Christ. There's a lot of Christians that truly have trouble touching the things that the Bible has said are part of our lives and part of our heritage as Christians. They have trouble believing for answers to prayer or they have trouble believing for, for God's provision or they have trouble believing that God can make a way in a really difficult circumstance. They have trouble believing all of those things. And I would say to you, probably more often than not, the root cause of all of that is they just don't see Jesus big enough. They don't see Jesus big enough. And if you don't see Jesus big enough, you know, if he shows up at all, you're going to be left astonished with your jaw dropped, not knowing what to say and suddenly realizing how much you did not know about Jesus. Jesus is not calling for any of us to be ignorant of him. He's not calling for any of us to live at some distance from him. We are meant to share a personal relationship with Christ that's close, that's abiding, that's intimate, that's real. And part of that is apprehending who he is and what he is in the scope that goes along with the reality of who he is and what he is. Do you understand me this morning? Say amen if you do. Amen. Now, um, <laughs> the second question, this is the question that Jesus asked. Well, it's actually the first question in the text, but it's the second question that we're dealing with. Is the one that um, we should let him ask all of us, I think. You know, uh, I think it's a good exercise in those moments where you're quiet and you're spending some time in the presence of the Lord. It's, it's good in those moments uh, to try to, to make sure that, that you're not holding up any shields you know, against the Lord. Um, you know, we try to protect ourselves sometimes, I think, when we, when we come to the Lord. You know, we're, we're not quite open, we're not quite released, we're not quite sacrificed, um, we're not quite surrendered. Um, and I think that, it is, that it's, uh, it's good for us to spend time often, frequently, uh, from day to day, and week to week, uh, being in the presence of, of, of Christ where we are just open books. Now, we are an open book to God anyhow, but there's something that gets accomplished when we are actually agreeing with that, when we're actually on the same page with God concerning that, that, we're, that we realize that God can see right through us, and so we are, we are just really letting ourselves be open before God, not trying to hide something in our thoughts, not trying to put on a show before God. Sometimes you do that, right? You get before God, and, and you, know, you can always tell when this is happening because you start slipping into King James language. You know, you know that you're putting on a show if you start saying, oh thou great and holy God. Um, yeah, you, you, you've, you've moved to the place where you're not actually open to God, you're someone who's trying to impress God, you're, you're trying to put on a show, you're trying to do the thing that you think is right. You know, when you come before God, you've got to be you. As you is you is. <laughs> you got to be you as you actually are and you've got you've got to have enough guts, enough faith in the mercies and the forgiveness of God in Christ Jesus that you that you have no advantage in trying to be duplicitous or trying to hide anything. Right? And so you just let yourself be open for what you really are, for who you really are, right? And you just have some time with God. It's one of the reasons why he's given us the Holy Spirit, so we can have those kinds of experiences. And we, we need to let him ask us this question, where is your faith? Now, I, I think that we often see what he asked the, the, the disciples as merely something that was disciplinary, something that was uh, rebuke-oriented. And, you know, it, it certainly did carry some of that. But more than anything else, I think that he was trying to get them to start thinking in the right way. 
Now, when he asked this question, he asked him, where is your faith? Um, the, uh, this is a, the, the format of this is that it's an interrogative adverb, uh, and it, the adverb that he used here carries the, the force of in what place. So he wasn't just making a, a general kind of like a quick off-the-cuff response to his disciples that, that was, you know, questioning, you know, their heart or, you know, where they were in, in the, the midst of their soul. What he was specifically asking them is where, at what place, in other words, in what place is your faith? He was pointing out by doing so that in the place where they were, there was no signs of their faith. On that boat, as they woke Jesus in a panic, as they were scared out of their out of their mind, as they were in the in the midst of thinking that that they were going to drown, Jesus was going to drown, everything was going to be lost. I mean, they they were having these kinds of thoughts. In the midst of that place, there was no sign of their faith. And so Jesus was asking them, you know, in what place is your faith? And it's a it's a probing question. It's a, it's a question that brings a spotlight, you know, within our, our, our hearts when we have to think if we hear such a question, right? Where is my faith? Is my faith a kind of fair, fair weather thing? It's only around when things are going right, when things are going wrong. It, it's, you know, it, it takes up its, its the baggage and hits the road. Is that the kind of faith that I have? Is my faith the kind that runs at the first sign of trouble? Is my faith the kind that withers at the first blast of wind? Now, you know, in the Sea of Galilee, it's an interesting body of water. It's about 680 feet or uh, 680 feet below sea level. And because it is that and surrounded by mountains and desert, believe it or not, the water is relatively warm. And I say relatively because, you know, when it comes to weather, it's always about, rel uh, you know, relativity. It's, it's always about the difference between one air mass and another or one, you know, one body of temperature and another. It it's, doesn't have to be a big difference. It doesn't have to be something that we would consider in its raw data uh, an actual uh, 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 warmness or coldness. I mean, if you go up to the Arctic and it's 35 degrees, that's warm, All right? But here, if it's 35 degrees, what do we think? Oh my goodness, turn on the heat, it's cold out there. Right? And, and, and so, you know, when you have slight temperature variations, you know, even a degree or two is enough to, to cause things to happen. And so, in, in this particular lake, Lake Galilee, you're in this, this body in this depressed <coughs> bowl in, in the, the ground at that place, and the water, it's shallow, it's maybe 50 feet on average of the depth of the lake, so it's not a real deep body of water. Um, it, um, it's relatively warm, but the wind that comes off the mountains that surround it can be actually quite cool in comparison. And so when that wind comes blowing in off the mountains and it hits the surface of that cold water, what you get is you, you start getting vortexes, you start getting unsettled air, you start getting convection and all the things that, you know, all, all the things that make weather, right? And so it is not unusual uh, on this particular body of water. Now, it's not particularly large either. I mean, it's, it's only like 15 miles long and maybe seven miles wide. Um, but in this particular body of water, because all of these conditions are there, what happens uh, 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 in this spot is you can go out uh, on the lake in a boat, right? And it looks like, uh, like everything's fine. The weather looks good, sun's shining, everything seems hunky-dory, you're ready to go. And you get out into the water and you know, suddenly a wind starts descending into that bowl, starts hitting that water, and apparently it's not unusual at all for squalls to rise on this particular lake out of nowhere. I mean, they just seem to come out of nowhere. And here's the thing that, that makes that interesting is that sometimes they can be, they can be pretty strong. They can be somewhat violent. Um, just about 20 years ago, a little more, there was a storm on Lake Galilee, and, and we had modern 
uh, you know, modern measurements that were capable of being made, and they had 10-foot swells on that little tiny lake. Now, you know, that over there is 8 feet. 10 feet is about right here. You know, that's, that's a lot. Uh, when I was, oh, 14, 15, I forget when it was exactly as far as my age now, uh, I got invited to go on a, on a trip with my uh, best friend's family. They were sailors. And um, they had been going down to the Caribbean in the winter and renting a boat and sailing around the islands. And they invited me to come along. So I didn't know anything about sailing, but it seemed like it would be you know, a cool thing to do in February. And not only that, um, you know, get to see the world and all that kind of a thing. So along I went. And we had a great time sailing from island to island. You know, uh, the, his dad was the captain, and all of us were the crew. And uh, around we went sailing in the islands. I, and uh, the only reason I tell you the story is that we were on the way, you know, working our way back to where we started, um, and a storm came up. And uh, I tell you what, within just a very short amount of time, there were. There were suddenly waves. You know, the Caribbean's not known for being a place that generates a lot of waves. But they were generating waves in that storm. And the waves were so bad, our boat would go down to the bottom of a swell. And honestly, at the bottom of that swell, you looked up all around you, and all you saw was water. Look up that way, look back that way, all you saw was water. And, you know, the captain and my, uh, my best friend Bruce, none of them were worried, so, you know, I just was taking in the scenery. But um, it was incredible. I mean, there must have been like 20-foot swells. Down the bottom, see nothing but water, and then you come up to the top, and like you can see all the islands are still in place. Everything looks cool. Um, and all I, I say all that to say this is that I can, I can somewhat imagine, like, if, if things would have maintained a little bit of violence, that, that I would have been a little panicked on that boat, I can understand why the disciples were panicked on theirs. Um, but at the, at the same point in time, uh, we have to see that, that Jesus found it a little incredulous that, that they were in that state of mind. You've got to think, well, Jesus, you're not being very gentle here. You know, you're not, you're not being very kind and understanding. I mean, these are just regular dudes. You look like a regular dude, but you're really not. They're just regular dudes. This is, a, this is a tough situation for the, them to be in. But I, I think that it goes back to something. Uh, uh, if you go back in the, in the text to verse number 22, where we started reading, right? What's it say there? One day Jesus said to his disciples, this is Jesus making a declaration to his disciples, let us go over to the other side of the lake. Now the particular grammar of that particular uh, phrase uh, is such that um, Jesus was not saying, let's take a chance and see if we can get to the other side. He wasn't saying, you know, guys, I feel like rolling the dice. It's a fairly good day. I think we can make it. Let's give it a shot. He, he wasn't saying that. Um, the, the, uh, the grammar of this particular uh, phrase uh, makes it clear that uh, Jesus was speaking from, from a, a viewpoint of certainty and was speaking from a viewpoint of expressing his, his wish or his desire. His, uh, this is called the subjunctive mood in the Greek, and in this particular case, it's in the aorist uh, uh, tense. And so um, it's, it's not something that, that Jesus was saying was a, a work that you know, would be continuing we're going we're gonna to start this and see what happens. He wasn't saying this is something that I merely hope or wish would, we would get done. He was making a pretty clear <coughs> statement, firmly saying, we are going to the other side. All right? In his mind, he was expressing his will for this little compadre of folks. We are going to the other side. Now, you know, when... When the Lord of glory says we're going to the other side, what do you realize? Hey, we're going to the other side. When the Messiah, yes, but even more clearly, when the Son of God says we're going to the other side, are you going to sink? 
No, you are not going to sink. Are you going to get swamped by the waves? No, you are not going to get swamped by the waves. Are you going to drown? No, you're not going to drown. When the Lord of glory says, we're going to the other side, take it to the bank, you're going to the other side. And so, what did Jesus do once they got on the boat? He took a well-deserved nap. He wasn't worried about it. He went right to sleep. The, the winds came, the waves picked up. He didn't wake up. He wasn't bothered by any of this. Why? He had expressed his will concerning this particular trip. The disciples, somehow or another, in the midst of their human panic, missed out on what the Son of God expressed as his will for this particular endeavor. So the circumstances overwhelmed their perspective. They got scared, they got panicked, and their faith vamoosed. I think that happens for a lot of us in similar kinds of situations. When, when we are pressed into a place where maybe it catches us by surprise, maybe we weren't quite really expecting it, but here it is, large, big, scary, and it's, and it's there uh, just testing our ability as people of faith just to deal with it, just to understand what God's will for us is. And uh, in those kinds of places, oh, it, it is so easy for us to, to get not only scared, but could you imagine if the disciples had any other avenue open to them at that point in time, what they might have done? Let's say there was another boat nearby. Would they have been yelling? Would they have been jumping in the water and swimming for it? Would, would they have been saying to those, you know, calling out to the other boat, hey, what should we do? What should we do? Probably so. Yeah, I think that, that that's the human aspect of us as just normal human beings. Is This is just the nature of where it's at, is the things that we can see, the things that we are experiencing in our flesh, the things that, that are scary as we're seeing and experiencing that, uh, those things. They have a habit of being louder in our mind and in our hearts than the voice of God than, the, than the, the words that express the will of God. Uh, it, it's easy for those kinds of things to so overwhelm our thinking that it, they just flush out the words that Jesus has just spoken. Jesus just said, we're going to the other side. And in the midst of all they were experiencing, man, that just got, whoosh, that just got cleansed right out of their thinking, right out of their mind. They weren't thinking that at all anymore. Now they were just lost in fear and panic. And say, well, they were just living in the moment. So it was Jesus, and he was sleeping. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's important when we think about what this little story teaches us about faith, our faith in particular. What's it saying to us? It's saying that our faith has got to have a few qualities. I'm going to give you a, a few suggestions here, a, a few details if I can summarize perhaps what our, what our faith should be apprehending at all times. Number one, it should be apprehending that God is real. As real as Jesus sitting in the boat with you. God is real. Don't ever lose track of that. You know, if you're in the midst of something that's trying you or testing you or starting to push you, uh, it's not time to lose track of that. It's time to double down and grasp that all the more fully. God is real. Sure, the circumstances you, you are in are real too, but God is as real as the circumstances we face. God is real, number one. Number two, God is control and all-powerful. You know, we used to like saying that when I was a young Christian. God's on the throne. God's in control. It was just basically kind of shorthand for saying, we know who has this. You know, we're not going to worry about this. We're not going to get swept away in anxiety and fear. We know who's in charge. You know, that's an important thing to always keep in mind. Always maintain your grasp on. And particularly when you're starting to get into the place where you're feeling like you're, you know, your thumbs are in the thumbscrews. 
when you get to the place where you're in between a rock and a hard place and you're starting to really feel the burden of that kind of environment, that kind of experience, then, as at no other time, you definitely need to be clear in this that God is in control and all-powerful. Thirdly, God is Jesus. You know, we, we can't ever, we can't lose track of that. Jesus was a nice guy. He was a good teacher. You know, you hear all the, you hear all of those kind of platitudes associated with, you know, folks trying to be nice about Jesus. I, I got to say this: Jesus was either a lunatic or he's a Lord, but he's nothing really in between. Right? And since I know that he's actually the Lord, I don't buy into the lunatic thing at all, right? But, but Jesus is God in all of his glory, in all of his splendor, in all of his fullness. Our God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus, you know, we often call him the second person of the Trinity. There's nothing about him that is less God than God the Father or God the Spirit, right? And so in him, are all the wonderful attributes of, of God himself. Is Jesus omniscient? Yes. Right? He was, while he walked on the earth, emptied of his, of his, of his uh, prerogatives, but now that he's come out of the grave and has risen back into glory, gee, does Jesus know everything? Yes. It, it, does he have all authority? Yes. Jesus is absolutely the, the uh, 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 God in the flesh, and uh, we need to remember that. Don't ever start kind of getting antsy. Don't, quite, uh, don't ever start hedging your bets just because trouble comes up concerning the Godhood of the Lord Jesus. Uh, fourthly, God is with us. He's in the boat with us. You know, sometimes I think we're, we're like walking through life and things happen. And we're like, God, where are you? Didn't you see this coming? Can't you see what's going on now? God, where are you? I'm in trouble. Hey, you know, no, we can't go there. It's, it's just not what our faith. Remember what Jesus said, where is your faith? In what place is it? Well, these are the places your faith needs to be. Your faith needs to be in the place where you see that Jesus is with you. He's in the boat with you. And then fifthly, I think that we need to see that it's uh, God's will to provide for us. Your, your faith has to see this. Your faith has got to be in this place where you see that God wants to provide for you. What did Jesus say? He says, don't worry about things. Right? The lilies of the field... They're more beautiful than Solomon in his glory, yet they're here today and gone tomorrow. Right? Sparrow doesn't fall from the air without the notice of God. Right? We are more precious in the eyes of God than any of those things. We have to see in our faith that, that God will take care. You know, that's tough when, when you don't see how. It's particularly tough, you know, if, if how ends up being, you know, throwing a line into the river, catching a fish and finding your provision. <laughs> right? Sometimes God's ways come just in time, on time. You don't see them, you don't see how they're going to make it to you. You don't see them on their journey towards you. Suddenly they just show up. Right? Often the provision of God is that way. And we need to be people in our faith. Our faith has to be in the place where we see that it's God's will to provide for us. We have to see that it's God's will to transform us. You know, as we're making this journey of faith, as we're walking after Jesus, trying to be disciples, and we have all of these, these great directives that we have from Christ himself. We have things like the Beatitudes, and, and we are, you know, trying to measure up to those things, trying to live up to them, and we, you know, we sometimes can get so frustrated. Why do I keep thinking that way? Why do I keep saying that? Why do I keep doing this? You know, those kinds of things can haunt us. We can start thinking, man, there's just no way in the world I can live up to this standard. There's no way in the world I can ever make it. You know, I've got to tell you, that's true. There's no way that you can. You know, if, if it was left up to you, you wouldn't get there. But, you know, here's the, here's the secret. It's not left up to you. Right? It's God's will to transform you. It's God's hand 
It's God's will, it's God's power, it's God's spirit that's going to make a difference. You've got to believe in that. Your faith has got to be in that place where you understand you're not left to your own devices, but God is at work in you. And the work that God begins in you, he most certainly will complete in the day of Christ Jesus. It's God's will to transform us. And finally, it's God's will to answer our prayers. You know, so often, you know, we'll find a way to try to excuse or, or to make an excuse for unanswered prayers in our life. And i got to tell you, sometimes, you know, prayer, uh, praying is a, a bit of a mystery. You know, sometimes we pray and, and we don't necessarily feel very good about where we, where we were in mind or heart when we were praying. And God just brings the most incredible answers and just kind of drops them at our feet. And we think, wow, that was easy. <laughs> See, in other times, you know, we feel like, oh, yeah, I'm really into this. I really got my, my eyes, uh, you know, fixed. I'm really believing God for this. And we pray, and it's like kaboom, and, you know, it blows up instead. And we think, huh, why'd that happen? I honestly believe that it's God's will to answer every, every faithful prayer. So if your prayer is made in actual genuine faith, if your prayer is made actually believing in Christ, having a faith that's not, where is your faith? <laughs> but is actually faith that is there that, that, that Christ uh, sees and perceives. i I, I got to tell you, I believe that every single one of those prayers is going to get answered. Um, you know, there's, just, there's things that when we pray, we carry into the situation that have nothing to do with faith. You know, like sometimes we're just insistent on having our way. Well, maybe your way is not what you think it is. Maybe your way is, in God's mind, something that's not too hot. Maybe what you really want in a particular circumstance is, is actually very much against the will of God. It's not like God's going to bow down and let you run the universe. Right? So sometimes we come to prayer and Faith is not what we're really praying in. We're, we're praying in the determination to get our way. We're praying in the determination to find, you know, to find something that's pleasing to us or something that works out for us. You know, we, we have an agenda that isn't God's. Sometimes that really will affect our prayer. And then sometimes, you know, the thing about it is God is not above letting us sit on the spit for a little bit. <laughs> You know, God's cooking up something pretty nice in you. Think of this way, right? God is cooking up something pretty nice in you. When God gets done cooking up something in you, you're going to end up looking just like Jesus. Right? And, and the truth of the matter is, in getting that done, sometimes you just got to hang out on the fire for a while. You know what I'm saying here? And sometimes, sometimes you've just got to be put into the straits because that's where faith distills that's where the rubber meets the road, and if you truly believe, that's when it's going to come out. That's when it's going to blossom. That's when it's going to bloom. Sometimes we, uh, we don't want the fire, and so we don't, come to, we don't come to prayer, or we come to just asking God in something that is even closer to actually being faith. But when we come to God knowing that He wants to answer our prayers, and we're not pressing our own selfish or fleshly or ignorant agenda. It's God's will to answer those prayers. Absolutely it is. And the, the, the cool thing is, is, is if you can ask those prayers in company with other believers, man, God makes a great promise that it's going to be answered. And so our faith has got to embrace this, that it's God's will to do certain things. Absolutely, unshakably. It's God's will to provide for you. You don't need to worry about these things. You do need to work, but you don't need to worry. It's God's will to provide for you. It's God's will to transform you after the image of Christ, and it's God's will to answer your prayer. See, if we have a faith that can, you know, rise up and make itself known, a, a, a faith that does not 
you know, require a question from Jesus. Where in the world is your faith? It's not in this place. Where is it? You know, if we want to stand before Christ with a faith that rises up and says, here I am, right here. I know who you are. I know what's in your mind, what's in your heart, what's in your will. I know what power you have, and I'm standing in this place in faith. You know, you, you kind of move from shivering into the stern. You know, I kind of think, you know, when I picture the disciples on this boat, I kind of I kind of picture them, you know, they're not on the oars anymore. The sail's certainly not up in that wind. They're probably back kind of shivering in the stern. Oh, we're going to drown, we're going to drown. And I think if they only had a faith in that moment, if in that place they had faith in he who was with them, Maybe they would do a Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio. Boy, that's harder to say than I would think. I won't say it the way Brian does. You can ask him after service. But, um, you know, you could do a Leonardo DiCaprio moment. You get up in the stern, right? You can stand up there so proud and brave and look into the wind and say, I'm going to the other side. The difference between having faith and not having faith. Having faith that shows up in the place that it needs to, and having faith that runs away, the first sign of trouble. We need to be people that have faith that is strong, that stands in the place that it's needed. People of faith. That's who we are, that's what we are. And let me just ask you today is that your faith? Bible says something about faith that I think is probably the most important thing that it says about faith in the, the entire Bible. Faith is the victory. Amen. Faith is the victory. And if we have faith, we'll find victory.